There's been over the last 20 years attacks on the role of the public sector. We have allowed a narrative about the public interest and the role of public authorities to be seen as a negative thing. And you know, of course, the trajectory that happened. COVID was a major moment of reflection and it highlighted the fragility around the public good and the public institutions have a role in it. Welcome to the Policy Net podcast by the UNESCO Inclusive Policy Lab. This is the place where top thinkers come to talk data and solutions that would reset us along a more fair and smart path. Today our guest is Charles Landry. He is the president of the Creative Bureaucracy Festival. Together we talk about the tough but critical topic of government capacities and the role of public sector in steering us through these times of crisis. Charles says we weaken our governments from within by steadily reducing their capacities to anticipate and react in times of need. One of the first things in the reduction of capacity has been to get rid of foresight entities and the strategic entities within public administration. What are these folks doing speculating about the world? Then you have a crisis, but you haven't got those people in those organizations that might have actually already prefigured what solutions might be and so on. So you've weakened yourself. He warns that the public sector is being infantilized and put on an unequal footing of external consultants. You've allowed the relationship between the consultant and the public bureaucrat to be one that I think is too unequal. The external person has much more power and knowledge and access to resources than the people working in bureaucracies. And I've seen that through 30 years, this erosion of intellectual capacity. Charles points out the dissonance between our expectations of entrepreneurial governments and our failure to invest in their capacity to innovate and reinvent the public sector. If you're a private company, someone said, I haven't got a search and development department, you'd say, are you crazy? Do you want to go bankrupt? Within the public sector, we also need to have these capacities to do more experimentation because we often simply don't know the answers. We need embedded systematic incorporation of innovation within public institutions. I'm UNESCO's Yulia Shevchuk and I'm your host here. So, Charles, welcome. Hello. Charles, we hear a lot nowadays about how the public sector should reinvent itself, how governments should be more innovative, more entrepreneurial, more agile, more adaptive, more everything. Basically, the call is for a reinvention of the public sector. And you've been working on these issues for years, and you coined the term of creative bureaucracy. So can you tell us what the creative bureaucracy is and why we need it? Well, obviously, it's an oxymoron. Bureaucracy sounds very boring and rigid, and creativity sounds interesting. So I'm trying to draw attention. Clearly, there need to be changes of many sorts within public administration. But if one were to suddenly say, you need to change dramatically, psychologically, that doesn't have the same effect as implying that you have something to contribute. The rules and regulations and work practices and organizational forms that are appropriate to now, to this period and to the following period, the next 10, 20 years. What should that focus be? Within that, there are a couple of core aims. What is the organizational structure that allows public administrators to do the best they can do? Secondly, how can the public administration connect better to the outside world, to academia, to business and so on. If you want to create a great city, you need to harness collective intelligence. Thirdly, there are new issues on the horizon. AI might be one, artificial intelligence, which really need to be thought of in terms of how do you maintain the public interest? The idea is to make people feel working within a bureaucracy is actually an okay thing. You can be proud of it because the history of the last 30 years has been, oh, these bureaucrats are all useless. And I'm trying to shift the narrative about that because if you want young people, talented people to work within these institutions, they need to feel these institutions have something in it for them, that they operate 
perhaps in the way that they operate in this world. So those are some of the threads that brought about this idea. What you're describing is a tall order because it touches on redesign of institutions, of systems, of incentives in an overall context of many countries that have seen decades of shrinking public sectors and reforms to achieve that. So how do you see that reconciled, this reality of the public sector shrinking and losing its appeal while needing to reinvent itself to be more creative and to step up its game? Does it happen or is it just wishful thinking? That's an interesting question. Over the years, I've interviewed various public servants at different levels of authority, for example, with Bilbao Metropolitan Authority. And then I did something similar in Adelaide in Australia. I had a long series of interview processes with all the levels in the organization. And I've asked them, how much more could you give if the culture of your organization was more based on one of the main slogans of the creative bureaucracy, which is how do you move from a no because to a yes if culture? How if that organization was warmer? I'm using the word warm in the sense warm to each other and so on. And just simplifying, the average result was that people are operating at minus 35% of what they could do. So I asked some people in Bilbao, Would you at five to five help someone who said, look, I've got this really difficult problem. Could you just help me at five to five when you go home at five? And they said quite often, actually, if the culture was better here, I would, of course, give as much time as you want. So this is about being able to work more. So there are two ways of looking at shrinking. One, you've got the existing staff. Could they do more? That means human capital is maximized, optimized. The other, you have to harness the collective intelligences and organizational attributes of different organizational types to help you do what you need to do and want to do. So in a sense, you've got all these helpers. If you unleash the potential of your partnerships, you're getting more, that horrible phrase, bang for your buck you're getting more out of less. But a third point is that we have allowed a narrative about the public interest and the role of public authorities to be seen as a negative thing. And you know, of course, the trajectory that happened. We have the image of Max Wave, the iron cage of bureaucracy. We have new public management. The business sector knows all the answers. I'm simplifying, of course. Then you have the next form, which is let's focus on the stakeholderships of the public out there. And then there's the public institutions for the people and then open governance. So there are all these threads that have moved forward in thinking about public management. And of course, it's not either or. But in the end, if you want to harness something, you've got to have more openness and closeness. And this is where public institutions historically have been not as good as they should be. Well, you're touching on very interesting topics and you've mentioned a couple of times the public image and the narrative attached to bureaucracies and public sector. Do you think COVID changed that image and that narrative? Did COVID help us understand that we need agile and innovative governmental institutions to make sure that we collectively manage such a crisis and prepare for anything else that can come our way? COVID was a major moment of reflection. It reminded us that civilization is a thin film of order we put around the chaos of events. It sort of highlighted the fragility around it, and it highlighted the public good, or let's put it like this, the public institutions have a role in it, which is about health. Whether it led to systemic innovation is a different matter. The challenge about the innovation agenda is that when we think of innovation often, we're always thinking it's just to do with digitization. Well, clearly that is one agenda. Clearly that does many things. It enables many things. You can have one-stop shops and stuff like that. But at the same time, as with any innovation through time, there are flip sides to these things. Data sovereignty, 
the control of human beings about their own life and data and so on and the fact that many things within the digitizing world ai and particularly are racing ahead of us so that the public domain is always lagging behind and chasing behind technologies that are running ahead sometimes we don't know what the implications are so even though there's a mass going on in digitization there are other forms of innovation as well yes you're talking about capacity to innovate but government capacity is much larger than that and indeed it doesn't refer only to digitalization the crisis showed the importance of investing in government and having standing capacities to address not only crisis but to govern not only when we need it but you can't deploy this capacity if you don't have it in crisis so yes, long term right. sustained investment in something that is not appealing but is absolutely required if we want to have able governments of course you're absolutely right when organizations don't work they say oh we've got to change the structure let's say the number 2 in an organization is difficult you want to really get rid of them so you change the structure and then you change the structure again and there's been over the last 20 years attacks on the role of the public sector and one of the first things in the reduction of capacity has been to get rid of foresight entities and the strategic entities within public administrations that's the easy thing you can just get rid of those what are these folks doing speculating about the world then when you have a crisis then you haven't got those people in those organizations that might have actually already prefigured what solutions might be and so on so you've weakened yourself and what has been the liberal response is to assume that some outsider let's call them the consult knows the solution and so on so you're continually exporting potential to external people then in turn we've allowed the relationship between that external person the consultant and the public bureaucrat to be one that i think is too unequal less based on mutual respect now as we well know if you took various sectors private and all of these together they all have some unique qualities and i'm not being simplistic and saying oh just if you balance it all in a lovely little way it'll all be perfect but there has been too much thinking that the public administration doesn't actually have a set of values and a way of thinking about them that could provide solutions and this is obviously where your covid discussion is so crucial i suppose i would be a bit disappointed or am a bit disappointed that we haven't taken that as a kickstart to say something more dramatic should happen we're talking about so many organizational types the national government the global governance city and regional governance and all these different levels what is it the innovations we actually want to do and we've already highlighted there clearly digital things you need to do we've highlighted that you need to think about working patterns that you need to perhaps think through we've highlighted by implication that you might need to go into some forms of partnership we've highlighted that you need to allow space for experiments let me give an example if you're a private company if someone said i haven't got an r and d department research and development department you'd say are you crazy do you want to go bankrupt within the public sector we also need to have these capacities to do more experimentation because we often simply don't know the answers i mean so many issues are of course wicked problems that are very complex Charles you talked about outsourcing parts of work or even functions of government institutions to external consultants now that's a hot topic so let's go deeper into that when it comes to investing in governments and their analytical capacities and their in-house expertise it is a tough case to make and a hard one to sell to the public these government capacities are built over long stretches of time and require sustained investment of generally scarce public resources in essence it's a public investment agenda and it requires public buy in 
Do you think the crisis we're living through help make the case by showing that these are the government functions, capacities and expertise that we all collectively need? Full stop. Now we can invest in them and grow them within the public sector or we can outsource them when they need it. The price may be triple for that outsourcing or it may be cheaper. Who knows? But you as the public, are you willing to outsource and pay the price for it to rely on external actors in some of the most critical moments? If not, then we should be investing in our governments. We should be investing in our public services and nurturing internal capacities. What do you think, Charles? Do you think such a framing could help the debate? I think that what you're making there is a very good, clear example, because you're making explicit the real costs and you're giving the public the choice about what needs to happen. So their choice could be then invest back, re-evaluate and revalue the public sector. My answer to that, of course, is yes. Some of that approach has been used in other contexts, which is to do with participatory budgeting. We know that it's an incredibly common thing to do. But sometimes the things that people desire in that element of participatory budgeting is 50 times as much as the budget or 10 times as much as the budget. I think Barcelona has been quite good at that. Making explicit, what is the real cost? You have to now make a choice. We can't say yes to everything. What do you want to have invested in? The problem in the particular case of participatory budgeting is that it's mostly people saying, I want more green space and more parks whereas there are many other very interesting things you could invest in. The making explicit of real costs is very powerful because it then forces people to understand the implications. The point I have been making is sometimes the implications are only seen in terms of costs and some of the things that are valuable, which are some form of capital, are also intangible and less visible. We're speaking about COVID, but then it's crisis after crisis, back to back, really. And many experts writing on this quote, innovation in public sectors around moments of crisis, such as National Health Service in the UK. Now, do you think that is true? Do you think that crisis push public sector to innovate? And if so, what are the examples you'd like to give us? I think people are tending to be overwhelmed by the crisis rather than pushed to innovate in a sort of more relaxed way. The system we described before, which was slightly better funded and there were foresight institutions and so on and thinking capacity, allowed people to respond in a more relaxed way. Now, they're completely unrelaxed and it may not be leading to innovations. As we know, various decision-making processes were shortened in COVID in order just to address an immediate urgency. Some of them perhaps slightly dangerous, like allowing certain vaccinations to be agreed, whereas the trials might have taken longer in another period. But nevertheless, it was a quicker response. I think because so many risks are happening simultaneously, the governing and governance capacity is basically not able to cope with the way that certain problems are inextricably interwoven with others. And then you're touching one issue, but it's a bit like trying to squeeze something that's bubbling over and with your hand trying to pat it down. And this is why it's so difficult to deal with some of these examples, because you need to work in interconnected ways, clearly. You need to be holistic. You need to be 360 degrees. You need to have transdisciplinary working methods where people from different departments are working together in order to address a problem, to see it from all sides. Under pressure, it's quite difficult to do that when you haven't already done it. But there are some good examples where what we try to do in the Creative Bureaucracy Festival is simply to highlight good examples in order to make the participants feel that they are part of a movement. And by making them feel that they are part of the movement, giving them more strength to act with greater confidence in any context that they're in, what would that greater confidence do? It would either say, yes, I can do this, I can try this out, we can move towards a yes-if culture rather than a no-because, 
But more importantly, it's trying to connect with all the other entities that are doing this sort of work in order to say, this is the direction we have to go. The problem is still not leading to the embedded systematic incorporation of innovation within public institutions that are both based and focused on equity and transparency and all the things that we want the public to be, whilst at the same time having this entrepreneurial, slightly startup spirit of we can do it, we can solve it. And that's the interesting challenge that I'm trying to work on and work with. I haven't got all the answers, but I think this is the direction of travel. Are you saying that the crisis is often about damage control and it's not necessarily a conducive environment for sustained systematic innovation within the government? It depends how big the crisis is. When I wrote The Creative City, I talked about the power of crisis to be able to transform things. But then the crises were less inextricably globally involved, climate collapse and so on. So it depends the nature of the crisis, when Glasgow declined as a city and lost everything and industry and all of that, that crisis actually reminded them that they've got an incredibly strong culture and then lots of stuff happened from that and 30 years later they were able to reinvent themselves. So the problem now is our crisis is so entrenched and difficult that it could and is overwhelming people. Charles, we're reaching the end of this podcast and we usually wrap up every episode with recommendations and concrete pointers on what should be done and what can be improved. So if you are to address policymakers and decision makers, what would be your pointers to them? There is an imbalance between the access to intellectual resources that those outside of the public sector had, which means that the conversation sometimes with a public entity is imbalanced. I know this from many, many cities where the external person has much more power and knowledge and access to resources than the people working in those local bureaucracies. And that means that they're being continually infantilized. And I've seen that through 30 years, this erosion of intellectual capacity. And so that is my main recommendation. There needs to be innovation everywhere, at every division, at every level. Now, if you talk to knowledge producers and to researchers, what are the knowledge gaps they need to be closing and what is the help you need from their side? Something that is quite pedestrian, but I think is very powerful. If someone would summarize the types of innovation and interesting ideas that have been implemented and their impact at every level, so that we as a collective whole, policymakers and all of that, know what things do work, can work, have worked, and what lessons one can learn from them. If it is well communicated and disseminated, all of the stuff that we're talking about, I think could be very powerful. The second one is to prove why public institutions with good intellectual capacities and new organizational forms, what their impact is on the wider world. I hear you saying that we need knowledge communities to help us make a case for public sector innovation and they need to invest in that. So let's end on this note and let's hope they hear your call. Thank you very much for coming on our podcast, Charles. It's been a great pleasure. Well, thank you, Julia, for your difficult, very considered comments and questions. To our listeners, we reached the end of this episode. For more deep debate and data-driven solutions, follow the PolicyNet podcast on all major platforms.